You may remember that we brought you the powerful story of Jeff Whaley, who, after living with motor neurone disease, ended his life yesterday at the Dignitas Clinic in Switzerland. His case has reignited a very polarised debate on assisted suicide here in the UK. Here he is speaking with his wife, Anne, a few days ago. I want the act to be designed so that any rational person of, 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 of who's in full control of his mind makes that decision can be helped in any way by other people without any fear of, uh, of prosecution. I mean, when you've got a husband as brave as mine, you have to. You have to Hold support him. He's the one who's being strong for me. How will it again? He really is. Yes, I will. I just just want him to be here. But I I know that what he has chosen to do is the right thing for him. I wouldn't put an animal through what he would go through if he went to the end. I just wish the Lord would allow me to have him for a little longer. I really do. Well, um, it's very sobering and it stops you in your tracks uh, hearing them talking together. It's worth reminding you that uh, Jeff's wishes were fulfilled yesterday and he died at the clinic. Um, that's the position we're in today as we talk about this. So let's introduce you to Mick Murray, who campaigns for end of life choices with the organization Dignity in Dying. And from Glasgow, Dr. Gordon MacDonald from the palliative care campaign group Care Not uh, killing. And if I could start with you, uh, Dr. McDonald, I mean, um, people have seen that report uh, and you may have seen it yourself uh, yesterday. Um, Jeff's wishes were carried out. Uh, I just wonder what you make of it, he hearing them and seeing uh, him before and knowing what's happened. <clears throat> well, obviously, um, all these cases are very sad and, you know, our hearts would go out to Jeff and to any, anyone else in similar circumstances. But I think the issue here is whether the law should be changed or not. And when we consider changing the law, we have to consider all the possible implications. And our concern is that in those jurisdictions where the law has been changed, that vulnerable people are put in a position where they feel under pressure to end their lives prematurely. Uh, and not everybody um, is always able to make those decisions in a rational way. Well, that's obviously um, the concern that's brought up, Mick, and you'll, you'll be aware of this. Can you tell us your experience of assisted dying? Uh, I've helped to organise the death of two of my friends, dearest friends, um, in Dignitas in the last uh, three or four years. Both of them had terminal illnesses. Both of them would have loved to have died at home with a party and their friends around them, uh, but they were prevented by the law here from doing that, and in the end, while they were still mentally competent but physically desperately ill and beyond the reach of palliative care, I have to say, uh, they made the journey to Switzerland. Can I just ask you, I mean, many people will think about this issue, have not had direct contact with it like you have. Did you have misgivings that you had to think through uh, about the process? Because you would have taken this hugely seriously. I mean, what, so what, what was the thought process? It's a broken law. It's all very well to feel profound sympathy for the plight of Jeff that you saw. I, I saw that clip yesterday on the television, on the television news at dinner time, and it reduced me to tears because that's a terrible position that nobody should be put in towards the end of life. Um, and obviously, my first loyalty was to my friends, and I acted out of, in a compassionate way, what I believe to be a compassionate way. And I think anyone faced with that dilemma, be it the wife or their daughter or their son or everything would act just as I did to tell the truth. The tragedy is that a lot of people can't afford to do that, can't afford to go to Switzerland for example. It's expensive, it's 12 or 13,000 pounds which people don't have available. And so we've got cases that are untold where people are trying to kill themselves at home in conditions where there's no safeguards whatsoever at all and often goes wrong because these things backfire. So it's a terrible situation that we're in and one which we can't just ignore because it's happening and the law, I think, needs changing. And it is changing with safeguards, of course. And stories, um, situations such as Anne and Jess being broadcast on television brings this to the fore and, and, as you say, it needs to be discussed. But, Gordon, 
what does need to be discussed in terms of the law? Because there are there are so many things to think about, aren't there? There, if if the decision is coercive, how do you protect someone from unscrupulous friends or family members? How do they then? prove that they're working for the good of the person, say, perhaps with a terminal disease. In the case of Anne, where she was questioned by police, where, how clear can the law be in the future to help people like this? Well, Parliament has, of course, recently discussed um, assisted suicide and rejected the proposal for a new law in this area to legalise assisted suicide. And the reason why that happens is because when politicians and other people consider all the issues, um, in the cases, they, they come to the conclusion that you just can't have a safe system. And when we look at other jurisdictions, such as the Netherlands, where euthanasia has been legalised, or even in Oregon, um, we see that there are people with psychiatric conditions being euthanised or, or given assistance to end their lives. So that's what the, the concern is, that means that politicians don't pass laws like this, because they know that you cannot have a safe system at the end of the day. I, even in Oregon, we have a situation where there is a higher than average suicide rate amongst the general population. It's, it's gone up from 35% in 2007 to 43% in 2014 in terms of above the national average. Can I just and ask Dr MacDonald, I mean every case is different as you said yourself a moment ago, but Mick has, has just, people will very much understand, uh, whether they agree with him or not in a way, they'll understand where he comes from, this, this sense of compassion, his, his loyalty to his friends come first. I mean. Would you want someone like Mick prosecuted? I mean, we all have compassion, and the whole hospice movement in the UK, <coughs> excuse me, is is based on the principle of having compassion on people who are terminally ill. And you know, I've had personal experience with with family members who've been in hospice, um, seeing how that works. And you know, it is a fantastic service that they provide um, through hospices, and these really need to be properly funded. And at the moment, sadly, in the UK, they're not properly funded. So and rather than getting distracted into the issues of assisted suicide, we need to properly fund palliative care and ensure that we have palliative care okay. across the whole of the NHS, not Mick. just in specific places. Sorry to interrupt you, Dr McDonald. Mick, a, qu a quick reaction in terms of the law, just how difficult it is to make this a good law. Well. Dignity in Dying is campaigning for two doctors to determine that you're within, you have a terminal illness and you have six months left to live. That's the first thing. And the second thing is it's going to ask a High Court judge to actually hear your case and determine that you're not being pressured or forced into this against your will. So at every stage there are checks and balances that respect people's right towards the end of life. And I think that's eminently reasonable. I think people's right to choose, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. Doctors can't force you if you don't want to. The judge is able to make a judgment on this. So there are sufficient checks and balances in place. And therefore, people should have the right to choose the manner of their own death within a civilized society. And it's no good saying that palliative care can care for everybody because even palliative doctors know that for many people, palliative care is beyond the reach of dealing with people in acute pain and agony towards the end of their lives. Uh, Mick, we thank you for sharing uh, your experiences with us this morning. And Dr. McDonald, thank you for your time this morning as well. Thanks very much.